Somebody once tried to define evil. Now I look at communism, even in its European versions, where it killed over 120 million people over 70 years. And I'm standing here by the flag of the Blue Division, the Spaniards who volunteer to fight communism. Now our next speaker hails from that country. He's a long-time chairman of the Spanish Wagner Society. He's an author of several books on history, literature, culture, politics and social affairs. He was also editor of a certain famous, uh, perhaps infamous magazine called Sedade. So here to talk about Richard Wagner's influence culturally and politically on England. Please put your hands together and give a very warm welcome to Javier Nichols. Buenos dias, good morning. I apologize about my accent. I hope that you could understand me. I want to read my lecture. Uh, usually in Spain we speak a lot. Usually we make lectures about one hour, one and a half hours. But now I reduced that into 25, 30 minutes, no more, I promise. Okay, okay I will talk about Richard Wagner and his influence in this country, in British, in England. Um, and then I will talk about the Bulgarians and the master and all the influence in the painters or culture or musicians or writers here in, in England. Okay, Wagner Richard Wagner was have been has been three times in England, uh, 1839, when he was completely unknown, 26 years old. Then 1855 was a little bit more known. And finally 1877 was on the top. Okay, the first visit he came with Mina, his wife and his dog, Robert, and uh, his stay in London. He doesn't speak any English, so he was completely alone. He only knew two people here in London, was Barbara Lytton, the author of Rienzi, and um, another person that was the director of the Philharmonic Orchestra. But both were, were, weren't, weren't here in London, so they were out of London, so he couldn't contact them. So it was a, a, a real disaster. This first trip to London it was a week here, seven days. But the most important of this, this trip to England was the trip itself. He made the trip in a boat, you remember, from Riga, Russia, till here to England. And during the... Oh, it begins. Okay, and during this boat sail, but I think I have a good place. Because... Okay, during, during this sail, it was a painful journey. It was a really a storm, and thanks to this storm, thanks to this Henley journey, he wrote the Flying Dutchman. We don't know what happened if, if he didn't do this trip into this boat. Maybe he made another opera, I have no idea. Could be. Okay, nevertheless, he was staying here in a hotel, I don't know if it exists, I don't think so, the Hook and Horse Show at 10 Queen Street, first time. And then in Old Compton Street, King's Arms. I don't know if that exists, but I don't think so, okay? Okay, uh, this uh, trip, the first trip, there's no more to tell because there were no, no other options, but the second one in 1855 was more interesting. He painted differently, yeah? This time, he was invited to give us a series of concerts here in London, about his music, his own music, and other music. Mm -hmm. He also came with his wife, Mina, and at that time, he lived Silent in, 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 in Switzerland, yeah? in Zurich, with the Western Dutch family. Okay? The most impressive uh, thing I have to do, I have to say about this trip was about a famous music critic named Davidson. Davidson. Mm -hmm. You can understand what I say with that Davidson. He was the most famous critical music in England. He wrote for the Times. He was a visionary man, as you could see. He wrote after the, his concerts of Wagner, he wrote, we have concluded that Richard Wagner is not a, a musician at all. Yeah. This man, this Wagner, the author of Tannhäuser and Lohengrin, and other hateful things, uh. especially the opening of the Flying Dutchman, his most detestable and odious work, born to feed spiders with flies, not to make happy the heart of man beautiful harmonic melodies. What is the music for him? or he to the music, visionary. 
were these men with so many apostles? Richard Wagner is a despicable charlatan, and his music is incoherent, vulgar, toneless, never well considered. So that was the opinion of the most famous musical critic in England, Davidson. Fortunately, the history of the music was another one, and Wagner was the top of the music, and Davidson, nobody knows him. <laughs> <laughs> Another person from this small country in the Middle East, or Wall Street, or something, Mayer Bear, who was the, 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 the genius at that time. Mayer was, uh, at that time, in 1855, when Wagner was here second time, he was the master, no? and Wagner met him. And he said that he couldn't believe because Mayer Bear, uh, was like a god here, and in Paris, yeah? and Wagner was absolutely nothing, unknown. Yeah? Wagner brought to Otto Bessendock from London and telling that, uh, speaking about the character of that city and about the English, with whom he does not identify at all. Hmm? Because, especially for the critics, for musical critics, you know, uh, he made a lot of concerts but without much enthusiasm and he wanted to return to Switzerland quickly. So, it becomes the third travel to. England, 1877. He was 64 years old. Yeah, Wagner was at that time on the top. Yeah, of course. He came with Cosima at the time, and uh, he conducted a lot of concerts with great success. He was received by Queen Victoria in Windsor, and but this is curious because Queen Victoria wrote in his notebook: After lunch came the great composer Wagner, who brings people regularly disrupted. He had last seen in 1855. He has aged and grown fat, and has an intelligent face, but nothing nice. Well, was Victoria <laughs> about <Wagner. laughs> Well, nevertheless, Cosima wrote a lot of in his in her notebook about the trip, and it was really amazing. Cosima loved London, city, town. They visited the British Museum, the Parliament House, uh, the National Gallery, everything here. Wagner, Richard Wagner, and Cosima. Okay, and then above all, they put. Uh, uh, the, the, the beginning, they made the beginning of the Bangladesh Association in England, that was the most important. Yeah? They were in contact with Pedro Lehmann, with uh, Barney Jones, the pro Raphaelite, with uh, other paintings famous, and but, but Cosima wrote, the English people are very brave people, but inexperienced, and nevertheless, all the people of Israel <laughs> in London. Um, Turn it again against us. Huh? Richard assimilates everything I say calmly. So, uh, in one part was the English that loved the music of Wagner, but on the other side were the critics. Huh? Against, always against Wagner, because, of course, of the pamphlet Judaism in Music. Okay? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the last concert at the, uh, at the, what is the name of the, hmm, I can remember, Covent Garden, yeah? was developed brilliantly and Wagner received a laurel breath and the orchestra gives him a speech, applause and shouts of excitement that never ends. So that was an incredible success. But they spared uh, not so much money, only 700 pounds at that time, just to begin the Bayreuther Festival after that. Yeah? Okay, the second story that I want to tell about the Wagner Association uh, is a curious history, busy and diverse history. Uh, but like in the other Wagner associations, yeah, at that time, yeah, the, the master the people that made that it was Ashton Ellis, William Ashton Ellis, was a good Wagnerian, a fighter, beating for a tough fighter who fought for years to get to Richard Wagner, was known and esteemed in Britain. Yeah? Uh, another curiosity of this English Wagner Association is the source of many of its members, as we shall see, came from German, from Germany. The case of Dan Euter, Klingort, and others. Yeah, it's curiously because then the English go back to Germany. Hafton Stewart Chamberlain uh, and Winifred Wagner. Huh? German here and English there. There's another man, Franz Hüffer, also a German one, that also wrote a lot of articles about Wagner. Uh, pretty interesting and pretty important, just to extend the Wagner music in England. Okay? They, they, this association, make a magazine named The Meister. Yeah? Okay, the Meister begins in 1885 till 1895, almost 10 years. 
and they defend drug and list. This is curiously because in our association in Barcelona, I was chairman during 15 or 20 years, we opened more segments. So we defend not only Richard Banger music, but all the Wagnerians, like Richard Strauss, Fitzner, Hans Fitzner, <coughs> Siegfried Wagner, or plenty of plenty of composers on the, on the Wagnerian circle. Yeah? But here only Banger list. Uh, Ashton Ellis also began to translate all the Wagner's prose into English that were really important. Yeah? And they began to organize events, concerts, conferences, everything. A long, a long, and a, and a wise work here in England. Okay? Um, after that came the First World War, the Wagner Association was disappeared. You know that before the First World War, they wanted to, to make a festival, a Wagner festival here in London. And they prepare everything to to uh, make the first production of Parsifal here. You know that Parsifal was forbidden to go out of Bayreuth, and they prepared here for 1913 to make the first bet begins the, the war, and then everything was out finished. In the 50s, there was the the actual the current Bangladesh Association. Uh, one of the presidents was the famous Ernst Neumann. I don't like Ernst Neumann. I think that. He is not Wagnerian, but anti Wagnerian against Wagner. He, he wrote a book, famous book, uh, it's the Bible of the Wagnerism in the Anglo Saxon uh, world, named it Wagner, the Man and the Artist. And if you go to the index of this, of this book, the personal characteristics on Wagner, wrote by Ernst Neumann. And the, the characteristics on Wagner are love of luxury, complexity of character. Selfishness, oversensitivity, extravagance, in the delicacy of his spirit, habits of rowing, ingratitude, irritability, blah blah blah. It's incredible. That's the problem with the Banner Associations right now. In Spain, we fight against the modern sets in the theater. Uh, there's a lot of people that love that. Okay, I respect that. No, but it's not in the sense that Richard Banner wanted. Yeah, and that happens also in this Banner Association at that time. There are a lot of troubles with the, it began the different uh, ways to understand uh, Bach. Yeah? <coughs> and then I arrived to the third part of my lecture, is the influence of Bangor in England. I want to talk about first Bob Lytton. You know that uh, Bob Lytton wrote the book Rienzi, and Bangor took this book and made his own person. Okay? And he wanted to contact him in the first trip, it was not possible, but after that they were in, were in touch a lot of times. Even Robert Lytton was in Bayreuth, invited by the Bangers, yeah? and they had a, a good relationship between the Bangor family and Robert Lytton. Okay? The second author I want to talk is Bernard Shaw. Of course you know Bernard Shaw. He wrote a famous book, The Perfect Bangerite. It's an original book, a really strange book. You know? it's a, uh, it's a, in a version, a social version of Wagner, yeah? but his book was really a shock into the Wagnerian world here in England, yeah? because of, of the Bernard Shaw, of course. But the people don't know that there are other, other works dedicated to Wagner from Bernard Shaw, really more interesting than that one. Yeah? For example, he wrote a book, a novel, uh, entitled In Maturity, mm -hmm. or another called Casual Byron's Profession. Or another, Man and Superman, all with uh, Wagnerian influences. Okay? Uh, Bernard Shaw also had sympathy for Mussolini and the Third Reich, as you know. And one could conclude that it was a critical wise in general, with a special satirical point of Wagnerian cult. Okay? Oswald Mosley, leader of the British Festival Union, and also a great Wagnerian, tried to reconcile Shaw and Wagner in his book, Wagner and Shaw, a synthesis, read in 1956. It was an interesting book about Show, Wagner Show, and Wagner, yeah? At the end of his life, Wagner Show was able to sit at the piano and sing excerpts from Mozart and Wagner. He played a lot of Wagner, and he wrote a lot of articles in the Star about Wagner. Really interesting. Okay, the third people is David Irvine. Not David Irvine, I don't think. <laughs> David Henderson Irvine was the most systematic and persistent admirer of Wagner and Schopenhauer here in England. And he was uh, an incredible fighter against the critics on Wagner, yeah? He wrote a book, The Ring of the Nibelungs and Conditions of the Ideal, Ideal Man. Really, really interesting. Yeah? And another Parsifal Wagner and Christianity. Of course, he was pagan, huh? but he has a good view of point, really interesting. His, his rated work, as I said, was to criticize the critics of Wagner. Hmm? He did not leave any standing. 
He wrote another books like The Misfortune of Wagner, A Venetian's Midsummer Madness, and so on. David Devine, don't forget him because it's really interesting. Okay, there are another, another uh, um, painters or literature in Wagner's influence, like uh, Charles Swinburne, or in the pre Raphaelite Brotherhood. Yeah? This, uh, this pre Raphaelite Brotherhood uh, was founded here in 1848, as you, as you know. They rebuilt the Middle Ages, and Richard Wagner's world was perfect for the purposes of this brotherhood. You know? <coughs> also, John Everett Millet, George Frederick Watts, Rudolf Lehmann, Bernie Jones, George Eliot, William Morris, Bursley, a lot of were under the influence of Richard Wagner, and you can read or see works of them with a, a, an enormous influence of Richard Wagner works. Even Oscar Wilde or E. H. Lawrence has influence on this, on this Wagner side. No? Uh, in the beginning of the First World War, 1914, the Glastonbury Festival was called the English Bayreuth. Of course, after the First World War, everything, everything changed. There was another history. No? But you can imagine the, 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 the meaning of the Wagner influence at that time here before the First World War. And then comes, for me, one of the most in interesting relationships uh, was with Tolkien, G.R.R. Tolkien, about the two rings. The Ring of Nibelungs from Richard Wagner and the Ring into the uh, trilogy of <coughs> Tolkien. You know? um, it is known that Tolkien rejected several times <coughs> that his trilogy associate the specific Venerian tetralogy. But nevertheless, there are a lot of a lot of things that are in both rings. You know? The ring is the center of the old stories. You know? The ring of the Nibelungs of immeasurable power. But in Tolkien, be, be the driver of the story. Wagner, in Wagner, no. Wagner is uh, an anecdote in the first and in the last season, but not in the middle. The ring disappeared in the middle. But in Tolkien, is most powerful. Yeah? In both cases, in any case, the power of the ring is the suggestion of the power of the gods. Mm -hmm. Wagner, as is known by his own hand, took some very specific when developing their own mythology and the ring works. The Son of the Nibelungs, the Eldas, the famous saga of Volsungos, the Brothers Grimm, Gustav Schwab, and others. Yeah? Tolkien was an Adventist. The Tolkien could read in the old uh, uh, speaking in Norwegian or Swedish or these old languages on that side of Europe, and was an expert in ancient Nordic languages. Yeah? So he could understand more than Wagner this, this world. Okay? But I think this is the key to finding parallels between both. Talking about Wagner, the fact that that stuff is primal as sources in the same sagas, and both wrote and addressed the issue in different ways. Yeah? But in both words, they saved the world, destroying the fatal ring, you know, the cursed god, the toilet of the gods, and evil occurs, and fire and water flooded this ring, you know, this damn ring. You know? But the difference is that in uh, the Nemean trilogy, the trilogy, sorry. There's not a happy end, I and mean, in Tolkien it's a happy end. You know? It's quite different. And then, uh, the big difference is Banner revitalized paganism in his work, a hymn to the divine nature, the human nature, but Tolkien was much more Christianized, I can say. He speaks about resurrection, Gandalf, about sacrifice, Frodo, or about restoration, Aragorn. You know? So it's, it's a message of hope and salvation, that in Banner is another thing. So, and to finish with both rings, other authors have suggested that Tolkien wanted to separate from Wagner when the rise of Hitler and National Socialism in Germany, the 30s. Could be. As the Nazis do a cataclysm semblance of Wagner and the Germanic world, Tolkien wanted to separate that from his own world. And probably uh, he wanted not to talk about it or reject it, this categorically. He wanted not to mix this passion huh, about her at that time. In any case, I believe it's impossible for Tolkien, an educated man, <coughs> would, would obviate the influence of Wagner on his own world. It's impossible. Okay? Tolkien undoubtedly used the same original sources as <coughs> Wagner, the same, you know? and in the original language, like Wagner translated into German. But on the other hand, it's also through that, as we have seen, there are many things 
that are not found in those early text sagas and legends. And Wagner invented that, I'm talking to that from Wagner, not from the original sagas, okay? There are some matches too truthful or obvious to judge and subject to the whims of fate or chance, but this does not prevent, belittle, or show anything to the genius of Tolkien, quite the contrary. The two rings are great, very, very great. Both belong to the status of literary and musical works that will never perish, never. Wagner and Tolkien recreated from an eternal and untouched legendary basis. A given work which again shook with excitement to many of his followers of us. Many thanks. Yes, our ideology is eternal, and therefore all the best people are Wagnerians. <laughs> All the best people are on our side. Paul Litton, William Morris, Houston Stewart Chamberlain, J.R. Tolkien, and Javier Nichols. Yeah.